What's up, friends? Welcome to Web3 Academy, a place for entrepreneurs, creators, and marketers to explore and learn how to use Web3 to transform business models and create thriving communities. Enjoy this next episode. Hey, friends, welcome to this next episode of Web3 Academy podcast. We're trying something new today. It's just me here, Kyle Reedhead, uh, one of the founders of Web3 Academy. And uh, I'm excited to share with you this new episode. So um, what we're doing here is I wrote an article and I wrote an article about Web3 talking about it's the next internet revolution and just talking about how it unlocks new business models uh, and tools for entrepreneurs, for creators, for marketers. And while this article is going out in the newsletter, we figured it would also be a great idea to jump on, uh, read it and dive deeper into different areas and topics within the article so that you can understand sort of my thought process as I wrote this article. Um, now I have a bunch of other articles that I plan to do this for, um, but what I need from you guys is to let me know if you'd like this episode. So jump in on our Discord, uh, the show notes, uh, the link is in the show notes below if you uh, are not already in the Discord, uh, and just let me know in the podcast discussion channel if this is a good episode or if you don't really like this kind of content, uh, or if you want to hit me up on Twitter, feel free to tag me there. Again, in the link in the descriptions, uh, you will see my, um, my Twitter um, page. So Finally, one other thing to note, if you are a writer or you have a topic that really interests you in Web3, whether it's a thought piece or it's an analytic uh, or research report, uh, or you want to break down a concept within Web3 and you want to share that with the Web3 community, we would love to share your content in the Web3 Academy newsletter. And if you're really feeling it and you're confident on video uh, and audio, then feel free to even record over top um, and we can throw it on the podcast for you as well. Why would you want to do that? Well, we've got a growing um, community. We've got a growing subscriber base, both in our podcast and newsletter. And we're going to push it out uh, to our subscribers, to our social networks, et cetera. Um, so we just want to keep sharing as much uh, information about Web3 as possible so that you, the listeners, and the community of Web3 Academy um, can be at the forefront of Web3 innovation. So with that in mind... Let's check out this article. So this article is called How Web3 is Unlocking New Business Models and Tools. Uh, and let's just get right into some of the topics here. So what is Web3? The next internet revolution. The Bitcoin, not blockchain crowd couldn't have been more wrong. If you were in the crypto space uh, from, I don't know, 2013, 2014, whenever the first other cryptos, like the colored coins and things got started, uh, all the way up until probably like 2018, 2019. I mean, I guess some Bitcoin maxis now even still say it's all about Bitcoin. Blockchain is not the, the innovation here, um, but they couldn't have been more wrong. And this is, has been um, so obvious in the last few years with all the innovation happening on top of Ethereum and now some of these other uh, layer ones. Um, and so there's, there's really three uh, big uh, technologies um, that are, are coming out or revolutions that are coming out of, of blockchain technology, okay? And so there's three of them that blockchain technology is uh, enabling all at once. One, we have the money revolution. Two, we have the financial revolution. And three, we have the internet revolution. And I think the best, uh, where I learned this from, and the best sort of example of this is if you are um, watching on YouTube right now, I'm pulling up the uh, report called Big Ideas 2022 from ARC. ARC is a very forward-thinking investment firm uh, led by Kathy Wood, um, and they're all about the exponential age, meaning what are the technologies that are going to grow exponentially over the next decade or decades? Um, and so if you think, you know, the last 20 years have really been around the internet and around mobile, um, and now this is kind of blockchain and then some other things like AI and, and, and other stuff. Um, but what they broke down was really, really interesting here of these sort of three revolutions happening um, with blockchain. And one of them is the money revolution. So this is your Bitcoin, your BTC, or your ETH, right? So this is like um, global decentralized non-state money. So money that's not owned by a country, money that is completely permissionless and decentralized. It can't be shut down. Um, and typically it's hard money. So something that's not being infl inflated away, like our fiat currencies, it's not controlled or custodied by banks or PayPal or all the fintech stuff. It can be owned and custodied um, by yourself. Uh, and that's really what 
BTC Bitcoin offers and an ETH is really proving to become uh, what a lot of people have memed into existence is ultrasound money. So that's sort of your, your Bitcoin um, and your, your ETH is the, the money revolution. Then we have the financial revolution. And this is DeFi. This is decentralized finance, right? Um, this isn't really happening on Bitcoin. It's more happening on ETH or sorry, on Ethereum. And then also other chains like Terra Luna uh, and, um, and Solana and Avalanche, et cetera. A lot of DeFi experiments going on on these sort of layer one smart contract platforms. And this is the key thing. And this is why it's not a Bitcoin is you need smart contracts to create um, decentralized finance. And in case you're unaware, DeFi is things like taking out loans or getting yield on, on, on your, your assets. Um, it can be derivatives and, and just all the different financial verbs that are out there. Um, so we, we move away from what, you know, typically you would get this in banks. Now you can do this in a decentralized fashion through blockchain and that's, that's DeFi. And then we have the third internet revolution or sorry, the third revolution happening on blockchains and that's the internet revolution. So this is the way um, they've explained it here is you think corporate owned platforms. So your Facebooks and your Googles, et cetera. And this sort of moves into interoperable user owned web, right? So it becomes sort of, uh, you can think of a lot of the applications we currently use, but in, in such a way that one single large company uh, does not own that and does not own all of the data of its users. Instead, the users own its own data. It's interoperable and we can move from one to another. And that's really what I'm going to get into uh, throughout, this, um, throughout this episode here. Um, so those are sort of the three uh, revolutions that come here. And if, if you're watching, I really like this breakdown here where we just talk about the, um, the trust that's needed for these three revolutions and sort of the, um, the decentralization aspect of the different blockchains and how much is required for each of these revolutions. So the money revolution requires the most um, decentralization possible, it requires maximal decentralization. This is why Bitcoin is sort of the king for um, for uh, non-state money, right? Bitcoin is the, is the big one there. This is where companies are okay putting on its balance sheet, um, even potentially, and, and in some cases already, nations are okay using this and making it legal tender because it's so decentralized um, that that's what you need for true money. You can't have someone that controls the money like we do now. And so you have Bitcoin for that. Then you get into DeFi, which still needs to be very decentralized, but might not need to be as much as like, as, as Bitcoin entails, right? So you can, you can have some trade-offs here. And this is, you have a big, if you're ever on Twitter, you see all these people fighting over, you know, the Bitcoin maxis hate all the other blockchains because they're not decentralized enough. Then you have people on, you know, Ethereum that are saying the other smart contract platforms aren't decentralized enough. And it's just, everyone's debating here. And it's like, look, you can have different blockchains for different reasons. All of these blockchains can work and that's okay, right? So you have Bitcoin as the most decentralized, there's your money. Then you have DeFi, which you need to be decentralized as well because you're going to use this money as collateral. This is why Ethereum right now is by far the biggest uh, when it comes to DeFi um, because people are going to be holding a lot of money in DeFi. It's large sums of value that are needed um, to create liquidity pools and to take out loans and, and have collateral, et cetera. So you need this to also be very decentralized. Um, so typically, if you're seeing this picture here, you can see Ethereum sort of hits the, the money revolution and also the financial and internet revolutions because um, it's the most decentralized by a long shot of any of the um, uh, layer one smart contract platforms. And then you have sort of the, the, um, the internet revolution, which doesn't necessarily need to be as decentralized. There's sort of lower value um, uh, transactions and things. Maybe this is gaming or metaverse stuff or, you know, I don't know, a decentralized Uber or whatever. And like, you need permissionless money to help with incentivizations and, uh, and that kind of stuff. But maybe it's not millions and billions of dollars of being locked into smart contracts like you might need for DeFi. And so this is where a trade-off to going to something like Solana or Avalanche or whatever might be okay, right? Um, then they have actually here, they show one other one, which is Binance Smart Chain, which essentially is just the status quo. Um, it is not decentralized whatsoever basically all owned uh, and all the validators are owned by Binance. So um, not really necessary, but maybe in some cases. And then you have the status quo, and this is non-blockchain. This is things like Visa and Amazon and all that kind of stuff. So nice little breakdown there, especially if you're seeing this and watching. Um, but those are sort of the revolutions that, that blockchain um, is, is providing us all at the same time. 
And so what I wrote here was each of these revolutions is necessary and important for us to achieve a future of global equality and free ourselves from overreaching governments and corporations. This is the true promise of blockchain and crypto. Okay. Now I think this is something that is important for people to understand. Like when we look 10 years out, 20 years out, what really are we trying to achieve by all of this experiments we're doing on blockchain? And it really is freeing ourselves from, and it's not to say governments are bad or corporations are bad. It's to say that they can be bad if they want to. And we have definitely seen many examples of both of these being bad, right? You have the, the stories of Facebook and what they've done with um, uh, Cambridge Analytica and you know who knows what actually happened there with the um, with the political um, voting and things like that. Then you have things going on with the government. We see what's going on right now with Russia and Ukraine, and how you know a lot of people are getting their money blocked. We had Canada who blocked uh, a bunch of people that were involved in the um, in the the riots or, or whatever you want to call it. So it's more just that it's possible to happen and that it can happen. And what we want to do by building out Web3 and by building out using blockchain is we just want to make sure that we don't ever have to worry. It becomes trustless and permissionless and anyone can use these tools um, and it can't be shut down or blocked based off of your belief or something else. And that's really the, the idea here. So what is Web3? Well, Web3 is the next iteration of the internet, okay? Permissionless, accessible to everyone, censorship resistant, and owned by its users. And I'll break down what that means in case you're still somewhat new or not, uh, not completely sure what that means. If we look at Web3, what's happening here, there's two key foundational changes to the internet, okay? And once you understand this, it really makes it a lot easier to understand what Web3 really is. So one is we've unlocked the ability to have digital ownership, Okay, so the ability to own something digital without the need for a custodian or trusted third party. This is truly important. And I don't think people really get this. We think that we own money, right? That's in our bank account. You don't at any point, And we've seen it again, like I talked about, banks can just block, like shut down your account. They can block it so you can't send to certain people or you can't send out at all, meaning you don't actually own that money. It is some numbers on an application that can be deleted with the click of a button. And that is scary. Okay, so what blockchain does is it allows you to own something just like cash, right? Cash you own and no one can delete that or take that from you unless you get robbed, right? But no, no one knows you have it. No one knows you're spending it um, and no one can just delete it from you. Okay, that's, that's, your, that's, that's real cash. Same with a passport, for example, right? Your passport is there and it's, it's a physical thing. And unless it gets robbed, you can't just delete it. Um, though I guess governments do have control of your identity, so maybe. Uh, but anyway... What, what's happening here is the unlock of, of Bitcoin and, um, and blockchain is that you can own money or things like your identity, et cetera, right? Equity, certificates, whatever. And you truly own it without someone else custodying it for you. That's the unlock of these sort of wallets like MetaMask and Phantom, et cetera. And, and really what's happening here, it's not even those wallets. Those just allow you to interact with it. But it's being, it's, it's, it's put into the blockchain, right? And um, and basically only you who knows the seed phrase to it or whatever password you have, have the ability to access it. And so you could think about it like it's cash, but it happens to be on your phone or maybe it's on your computer. It's on the actual device. Okay. Um, and only you have access to that. And so that's true ownership. Not even the, the people who made your wallet like MetaMask, they can't even, they don't even know that you are using it and they can't block it. They don't have access to your funds, et cetera. So that's true digital ownership. And again, this can be in the form of tokens, like we're aware of Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin, et cetera, or non-fungible tokens like NFTs. Okay. And this is where you can get into identity and certificates, et cetera. The second thing here is interoperability of you and your digital goods across the internet. So this is a this is a really cool unlock. So interoperability in Web3 means your crypto, or your Web3 wallet becomes your one secure account or profile for the internet, right? It moves in and out of applications along with what's inside of it. So this means no more hundreds of accounts and passwords and no friction to move from one platform to the other. So what I mean here is if you have a, an account on Twitter and you have, I don't know, 20,000 followers and all of a sudden, you don't like what Twitter is doing. Maybe they sell to Elon Musk and you don't like Elon Musk, or maybe Twitter starts to do a lot of bad things in the world. Well, you're going to want to move off of Twitter. You don't want to use that platform anywhere because you don't agree with the owners of the platform. Well, it's very difficult for you to, to do that because you are going to have to create a new profile somewhere else. 
you will now lose your 20,000 followers. You will lose all the content that you've posted or created over the last however long you've been on there. So it's very difficult for you to move from one platform to another, right? And this is true of all of Web2 stuff. Even things like, it, let's say you're an Uber driver or just an Uber, like you use Uber and you have a, an Airbnb uh, a house that you put on there, or maybe you just use Airbnb, right? Well, you have a reputation. That reputation is very important on both of those, right? People book uh, Airbnbs with hosts that have good ratings. And if you have a bad rating, you don't tend to get as many um, bookings. Well, if you were really good on Uber, there's a good chance you're also going to be a really good host on Airbnb because you understand hospitality, et cetera, right? And customer experience but they don't connect. They're not interoperable. So maybe you have a really good reputation on Uber and now you go over to Airbnb because you want to list your house, you're starting over, right? So there's interoperability between social, but there's also just between your reputation, okay? And same with things like your, your money, right? What if you earn a reputation or you earn money in Facebook and you can't now use that in Twitter, right? Sometimes you can play games and you can earn things in certain platforms. You can't bring that with you to another platform. Yet in the real world, we can, right? I can make money doing whatever and I can go from any store, any event and I can bring my identity, who I am, me, Kyle, and I can bring my money and move with me. But you can't do that in Web 2. And so what Web 3 does is it allows us to just move interoperable, okay? From one platform to another. And I take my account, I take the things I own, I take my identity, my reputation, all this stuff with me. I don't have another login. I just have one login. That's my wallet, my, my, my crypto wallet or my Web3 wallet, like MetaMask. And I just connect into platforms. Instead of logging in, I'm connecting into platforms, okay? So you can see this, this image here that's up on the screen. We have Web1 is where you type in your username and password. Web2 is sort of the sign in with Google, sign in with Facebook, sign in with Twitter. Um, I don't know how many people actually use that, but it's, it's a thing. The problem is, again, that's just giving even more data to those platforms and they can ban you at any time. So it doesn't really give the interoperable unlock like what I'm talking about. And then you have Web3, which is just connect wallet. You're no longer signing in anywhere, you're just connecting. And I can, um, I can show you what this looks like as well. If you're looking on the screen here, I have Uniswap up, which is um, a platform to exchange any type of value that exists on Ethereum um, and, a, and a few other blockchains. And all I have to do is just click connect wallet. I can click MetaMask and my wallet's gonna appear. It's going to ask me to log in. I'm not going to do it right now, but once I log in uh, to my one wallet, uh, it's just because I haven't logged into it for a while. Now I can just connect that to any application on in Web3 and it, and it moves with all the things that I have in it. My NFTs, um, my identity, which I have connected into it. So what my name is, et cetera, um, and all, anything else that I own inside of that wallet. So Web3 uh, interoperability creates an internet experience more like the real world. So here's an example that I wrote, and I just sort of touched on this as well. Um, but if we buy a shirt in a store in the real world, we don't have to leave it in that store when we exit. Okay. In Web2, however, if we buy something in a game or on Facebook, it stays only in that game or on Facebook. In Web3, we can take it to the next location, just like in the physical world. But wait, it gets better, okay? So where Web3 takes even the real world experience to a whole new level is through programmability. Programmability we can't do in the real world, not yet anyway, maybe eventually we can. But what I mean by programmability is we can program anything based on the digital assets or the activity that's in my wallet. So whatever is in my wallet, I can now show things or send certain messages or do certain things on the internet inside of my application based off of what you hold. So if you're a Board Ape Yacht Club holder and you have an NFT in your wallet, the application can read that when you connect and it can show you something different than what someone who is, let's say, a CryptoPunk holder or a Moonbirds holder, okay? So this is programmability right here where you can start to create specific digital experiences. You can provide access. You can show content seamlessly just based on the user's wallet. And that to me is a really, really cool unlock for entrepreneurs, for marketers especially, um, and really for anyone using this. Now, one of the main important things of Web3 is that it's equalizing the playing field. And this is what excites me the most um, about Web3 is Web3 is all being built using decentralized and censorship resistant platforms and apps. Okay, so yes, you can own things, you can, it's interrupt. So we're interoperable and you can move around and, and just connect to different apps. But really the, the big unlock here is that 
whatever is programmed into these applications, it happens. It does not matter your race, your location, your beliefs, your values. None of this stuff matters. Okay. You, anyone can permissionlessly, and this is the important word, permissionlessly interact with these protocols. And that is the big unlock, right? So let's say you need banking services because banks turned you down for living in a poor neighborhood, right? Um, Web3 fixes this. That's no longer a thing. It doesn't matter. And especially places like the US, if you're rich, you get better rates. You can take out loans for cheaper. You can do certain things differently um, than depending on where you live or who you live near. And so Web3 gets rid of this. Anyone in the world can interact with this stuff, right? So let's say you need funding for an idea across the world, right? But there's a lot of regulations and rules, especially in different countries, right? There's a lot of countries that have blocked cross-border payments. Look at Russia right now, right? But there's many Middle Eastern countries that can't use things like PayPal and Stripe. Um, and depending on the country you're in, you might not be able to access capital or customers um, from different countries. It's a little bit insane to think of in 2022, but that's the way the world works right now. Well, Web3 fixes this, right? You want to share your beliefs on social media without being banned. This is a massive problem ever since COVID in the last two years. Well, again, Web3 fixes this. And let's say, I don't know, you want to sell music, a short film or a book, but you're not connected to the big corporate publishers that are going to do this for you. Well, you don't need that anymore, right? Web3 fixes this. Anyone can just turn it into an NFT and you can sell it through social. You don't need all these big corporations to handle all the, um, all the, the um, intermediary stuff for you. So it's a massive unlock for equality across the world. And that to me is the most exciting thing that's coming out of Web3. So you might be asking, okay, we have these decentralized blockchains, they're censorship resistant and, um, and you can interact with them permissionally, et cetera. Um, so why do we need you know, tokens and NFTs? Why do all these applications have a, a token that comes with it? Um, and so this is a huge unlock, I believe for, for entrepreneurs um, and for product experiences, and just I think um, it's just going to make things a lot more. Um, I want to say user friendly. I know it's not there right now, but I think it is going to make things more user friendly. Um, but it's also just going to incentivize users more. And I think as we use the internet, you're going to get paid to do things on the internet now. Um, and I think that to me is a very interesting uh, concept. So let me just break this down for you. Tokens, and now tokens can be fungible or non-fungible, right? So non-fungible is something where there's only one of it, right? Like your house. Fungible is something where every single one of those fungible tokens are the exact same, right? The US dollar is a fungible token, right? Um, Bitcoin, ETH, et cetera. So these tokens act as tools in Web3 that serve many purposes for communities, for developers, creators, and businesses. And so let's break them down. We have fungible tokens. So fungible units of account that can be used as, let's say, a currency, maybe it can be used as equity, governance, reward systems, point systems, et cetera. That's kind of how you would use fungible tokens. And then you have non-fungible tokens, which can represent ownership of anything on or off the blockchain. Art is the kind of the, the way that this became most popular at first, right? In 2021, this became a big deal, end of 2020. And so it's easy to understand there, but I want you to think past that, right? What else is non-fungible in our world? most things, certificates, event tickets. This is going to be huge. Domains, like your www. Uh, awards, your keys to your house. These are non-fungible. Real estate, prescriptions, identity, data. All of this stuff is non-fungible and it can be put on the blockchain and it will be put on the blockchain soon enough. Um, and so that's going to be a massive unlock for a lot of different experiences on the internet and different ways of creating and sharing value on the internet. So these Web3 tools, whether it's a, a fungible token or a non-fungible token, are a means for creators, communities, and entrepreneurs to establish a few things. And honestly, there's a, more than just this list, but funding, obviously, right? We see this with, um, you know, when you launch 10,000 NFTs, which is very popular lately, um, that's basically just a way of getting a bunch of funding for future work, right? People see you have a cool roadmap, maybe you're going to create a game or a metaverse, and so people buy this image, right? The image isn't really worth anything, but they're buying it because they're getting ownership of something uh, inside of that company and they're giving you funding and now you can go and act on it. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of rug pulls and people that don't do anything and they just take the money. Um, but eventually that's going to get all washed out. And really that's what NFTs is here is a way to collect funding. Same with tokens, um, 
fungible tokens, right? You get a bunch of people that buy into your tokens, creates liquidity, and now you have the ability to sell those tokens to then go and build and hire people or do whatever you want. Capital distribution. So let's say you don't want to be the full owner of a company. Right now, we can do this by like an IPO. Um, but if you want to distribute capital pre-IPO, in America anyway, the SEC only allows you to do that to rich people. You have to have a million dollars or more for me to allow you to invest and in, for me to distribute capital uh, of my company. So let's say equity is another term here. Uh, it makes no sense. Just because you have a million dollars doesn't mean you're a better investor than someone who has a thousand dollars, but that's what the SEC says. Well, this is a way that you can get around that. Um, we'll see. There's still obviously a lot of regulation, but um, I think that's uh, we will we will break those regulations and those rules, and and eventually um, Web three and this sort of equity through tokens will will thrive, in my opinion. Then we have governance, right? So if you want to um, have your community help you decide what your protocol or your business should do next. Um, or, you know, we've, we've heard of DAOs, um, a governance structure where people can vote so long as they have a certain amount of tokens in their wallet. Um, access. So I talked about this one already. If you have certain NFTs or tokens inside of your wallet, um, you can give access to Discord groups or to content on a website or whatever else. Um, IP. So we just saw this with the Coinbase and Board Ape Yacht Club movie that's coming out. Owners of NFTs may get, also get ownership of IP. Now they don't always, it depends on how it's structured, um, but you can give IP away. Uh, and this is what like V Friends, so Gary V is, is, is doing, he's trying to be the next Disney with V Friends um, and owners of his NFTs, of his V Friends um, are owners in that brand. So I think that's really interesting. Um, structure and organization. So again, uh, this gives you, you can think of it again as a combination of equity and governance, um, but maybe a certain uh, people that hold a certain amount of tokens um, get a certain level of access and maybe they have a certain level to vote on certain things, whereas people with sort of a smaller amount of those tokens can only vote on certain things. Like you get to make rules and, um, and it's all fluid and allows this to happen. So that's really interesting. Incentives, right? We, we, we know incentives in the form of like credit card points or in the form of um, airline um, points and, and gas points. If, you, if you're signed up to any of those kind of credit cards, um, tokens allow you to do that in a way where not only you're incentivized to use it, uh, an application or a protocol or whatever, it could be an airline, but now it's on liquid markets that are open to global markets and you can sell those rewards for ETH or Bitcoin or USD, whatever. Um, and so that's very interesting unlock. Uh, and of course, branding, right? That's, that's really what a lot of these NFTs lately have been is um, it's a form of branding for the thing that you're going to build. Um, and people can use your NFT as their profile picture, which is just great branding for your project and whatever it is you're going to build. Um, and so it's interesting that these tokens again, NFT or, or fungible tokens are not just one of, they are all of the above and they can be used for multiple purposes. That's the true unlock I see in Web3 with tokens is that it's not just a means of funding. It's your funding, but it's also your governance. And then it's your IP and it's your access tool and it's your branding. And it also incentivizes people. And it's like, it allows you to do everything with one tool. That's huge. Just think about trying to do that in traditional world. It's just not possible. So Yes, we can. So sorry, it's not that it's not possible. We can do all these things in Web 2. Nothing I said there is, is like revolutionary or new, but why is it better as a token? So Web 3 tools make all of these in order of magnitude better, at least because they can be created without permission, with zero intermediaries in seconds and be available on global liquid markets immediately. Think about that for a second, okay? This is a massive unlock for innovation and capital flow around the world. Think about the cost, the time, the sweat that it takes to start an LLC in the USA, okay? Takes days, weeks, probably months in most cases, okay? Then you need to go and open a bank account so that you can actually take money within that LLC, right? So two separate things now you got to deal with, two separate entities, okay? And the government decides if you can have an LLC and they own that LLC. And then a bank decides if you can accept money, Okay. Now, if you want to acquire funding globally, which in most countries, it's not even possible, right? Think about how difficult that is to do. And then who owns that funding? The bank does, because that's where you're going to store it. And who decides on who you can get funding from? Your government does, right? And then let's say you want to file patents or trademarks, right? Or maybe you want to hire a team globally. Well, who owns your patents and your trademarks and how, who decides 
on those. And how long does that take? Years, typically, right? You want to hire a team globally. Well, now you have rules and regulations on who you can hire, what you have to pay them, what their minimum wage is, what kind of benefits you're going to give them. I can do all of this in less than 10 minutes. And it's to the whole world. Anyone can access it. Anyone can get all these things. I don't need to ask permission from anyone. And if you don't, if the people that bought it don't like it, they can just sell it and move to the next thing, right? Whereas everyone else who invested, if it's in the Web2 world uh, in your company, they got to wait until you go public before they're able to sell it unless they can find a buyer. So it is just in terms of efficiency and capital flow, it's just an absolute insane unlock that I just don't know that most people are grasping right now. And this is just going to accelerate innovation at uh, an unbelievable level, especially in places outside of the US, right? The US already has, although I guess I've been making fun of the US this whole time, they have a lot of difficult regulations and rules, but they do have a lot of funding and ways to get money. So a lot of innovation happens there. It's diff more difficult in other countries. Well, this unlock for the rest of the world, again, equalizing the playing field. And that's what's really exciting to me. And then I guess there's one thing to remember. You know, tokens and NFTs are also programmable. So I talked about all the things they can do up uh, just above there with funding and capital distribution and governance. Plus, you can program things in, right? So not only these tokens have all those capabilities, they also have utility of replacing most marketing and growth tools that businesses use, right? So what this means is that a token can be a form of equity and your access into a Discord community, okay? Or a ticket to an in real life event, right? It means that your tokens can be a form of governance in addition to an appreciating asset that also shows you premium content on let's say Netflix or your favorite blog, right? So there's just, there's so much utility that can be done with these. Um, it's, it's actually really incredible. Now, uh, just as I wrap up here, there's one thing I just wanna say is that Web3 is not there yet, okay? Web3 is not yet in its full form. It's not completely decentralized or censorship resistant by any means, right? So Ethereum and Bitcoin, very decentralized, okay? No one can shut those down. Hard to say that about the rest of the blockchains, Solana, Terra Luna, et cetera, but it took time for both Bitcoin and Ethereum to get there, right? It took years for them to be as decentralized as they are now. And so it's going to be the same for Solana and Terra and whatever. So a lot of people are chirping them for not being, um, you know, decentralized. They might get there. We'll see. There's been a lot of blockchains that said they were going to and never did, like EOS and, and others. Um, so maybe they go to the shits. We'll see. But um, they can get there, right? Um, and, and also, uh, the blockchains may be decentralized, but the applications built on top of it are not. And there's really not many of them that are at all right now. But again, we are working towards that. And it's going to take time, right? Um, Web3 is not seamless and interoperable by any means right now. It is difficult to use. It is not meant for mainstream masses yet, right? Um, but again, we are working on it. We are improving. It's light years ahead of what it was three years ago, right? It's, it's, so it's, it's, we're innovating and it's getting better, but it is not there yet. And we don't know the best token structures. Many NFTs are going to zero. Many tokens for DAOs and for protocols are not doing well. And that's because we don't yet understand all of the utility and how to distribute tokens and the tokenomics of it all. But we're learning, right? And it's, it's happening and it's coming. And same with the internet. You know, when it first started back in the 90s and 80s, like it took a long time to get to where it is today. Even in the 90s, when the internet was available to everyone, not everyone used it because it was slow. We had dial up. You couldn't even use your phone if you wanted to use the internet, right? Um, so uh, it used to be very slow. You couldn't watch video on the internet back then. You couldn't even have images back then. We didn't even have web browsers at one point, I remember um, when I was on computers. So, you know, and now, people couldn't even imagine to use a computer without a web browser, right? Uh, or to use the internet without a web browser. So um, web three is going to change and it's just going to take some time, right? To develop, to prove itself, et cetera. And we just need to keep experimenting. And so um, one of the things I would say though, is like, just because it's not ready for the masses doesn't mean you shouldn't use it or understand it or be building on it. It actually makes more sense now to start understanding and supporting and using this technology than kind of just sitting there and waiting, right? Those that dove deep into the internet back in the 90s, they're the ones that built the big businesses, you know, the Amazons and the Googles, they were all building in the 90s. They weren't just building now when they're big. It took a long time, a lot of experimenting and learning. Uh, and the same is true of Web3 now. Um, and, and, and the reason as I ended this here is the utility and the opportunities that Web3 provides for every person on the planet is literally endless. And in my opinion, it will change the world just as much or more 
as the internet itself did, right? Web3 is not an if, but a when. Web3 is inevitable. And that's the article that I wrote, guys. And I hope that you, um, hope that you enjoyed uh, this article and sort of this breakdown of what Web3 is. I try to give it a different perspective um, and, um, and try to make you kind of see it from a, a zoomed out approach, from a different lens. I think we get caught up a lot in just these like profile picture NFTs that are happening or these crazy tokens that are just mooning and people are trying to you know buy and sell them and make all this money. And it's like, look, if we step back, there's some true utility here uh, and it is going to change the, the way that we do business. It's going to change probably the way that we structure our organizations and structure our countries even. Uh, it's going to change a lot. Uh, it's just going to take some time to get there. So thank you again for listening. Uh, and again, if you have any articles, whether it be thought pieces, it be research reports um, or anything, as long as it's to do with Web3 Academy and it's going to help you believe anyway that it will help our listeners um, have a better grasp on Web3 or understand how to use certain tools or different things inside of Web3, uh, we would love for you to submit your article. If you just go to the article uh, that I read, um, there is a, uh, a submit your article section in there. Uh, we'll take you to a website with a form and you can share all of your different information there. Um, but if you liked this one, please go inside the Discord or hit me up on Twitter. I think it's Kyle.Readhead. Maybe it's just Kyle Readhead. Um, and hit me up in there and let me know your thoughts. And uh, I've got a few others that are going to come out over the coming weeks uh, with more detail into Web3 wallets, uh, with more detail into use cases of tokens. Uh, and so I'm going to break those down for you. Um, but uh, thank you again, everyone, for listening. And I wish you uh, a wonderful day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. And if it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. By the way, if you have yet to join the Discord community, you are missing out. This is where all the magic happens. This is where we learn, where we ask questions, where we network. Uh, you want to be in there. The link to join is in the description below. And finally, a quick disclaimer. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.